Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you all today. I know some of you may not be able to see me. I hear the allergies are just driving people nuts. Uh, I was just talking to someone, and they're like, look, if I'm just crying, it's not allergies. And I was like, don't tell me that. I think the servant is moving you. Yeah, but it is that time of the year, but we're glad that you're here and you made it out. If you're watching us at home and you're just trying to take it all in, and we appreciate that as well. Uh, we're just happy that you decided to worship with us today, whatever state you came in, and we're glad that you're here. So uh, a few things, uh, if this is your first time with us or if you have uh, some new information or a prayer request or something that you want us to know, uh, we ask that you would take a minute and fill out the Connect card in the seat back in front of you, or you can scan the code and do it online. If you have our app, uh, you can do it there. Uh, a brief mention, uh, as we I mentioned the app, next week we're going to roll out our new app. The old one is still good until June, so if you use that to do online giving or anything, you have until June to officially transfer your stuff over. Uh, but we'll talk more about that next week. I just want you to know that it is coming. Um, it's mostly a financial thing. So this new app is cheaper and better. So we're going to do that. Uh, but we'll talk more about that next week. But speaking of giving and, and online, if our ushers could come and get ready to take our offering. Uh, right now, all of your giving and stuff, uh, however you've been doing it, works great. It's totally fine. Again, the, the, the current app is good until June. Uh, but next week we'll roll out the new one. So if you want to give online, you can still do that by scanning the code there. If you want to put something in the plate, we would love for you to do that. If you're writing a check or, or you just happen to be talking to your neighbor, as the plate goes by, you can always drop it in the offering box on your way out the door today. Uh, and if you're at home and you just want to stick it in the mail, we can get those too. I check the mail uh, every day. My wife thinks it's weird. I make a special trip down the hill to get to the mail. But you just never know what's in the mail. And I love opening the mailbox and getting money, even if it's not mine, right? Even if it's not mine, it's, it's a good feeling. So uh, however you want to do that, we will take it, and we are appreciative. We are also in the middle of our building, uh, I don't want to call it a campaign, but uh, trying to pay off our building fund. Currently, we are sitting at just under $14,000, so 13000 and change uh, to pay off the roof and new air uh, air handlers and some sound equipment, and a whole bunch of other things. So if you'd like to contribute to that specifically, uh, you can do that that way. Uh, or if you send something to us, you can mark on it that it goes to the building fund and we'll get that where it needs to go. So uh, a few announcements, some things that are coming up. This Wednesday is our monthly fellowship dinner and that is at 6 p.m. We're gonna have some food, we're gonna have some games, we're gonna have some fun conversations. It is a lovely time, and we are blessed to be able to do that. And so if, if you want to come to that, we'd love for you to come, bring some food, bring a game to play. If you want to bring some friends with you, it's very non-threatening. It's one of the easiest ways to get people in church. Hey, we're going to play cards, and there's food there, <laughs> and people will come. If you feed them, they will come. So uh, it's a lot of fun. So make sure you, ma you make plans to attend and try to bring somebody with you. It'd be, uh, that would be wonderful. A few other things. Uh, next Saturday, the 29th, where is our annual, well, I guess we do it twice a year, but is our uh, April, our spring cleanup day for Adopt the Highway. We landmark Adopt Sackett Road, which is just the, the long road up here, but we also have most of Willowbrook Road as well. And so the more people that come, the quicker that is. Uh, but it's normally a nice time to get out and meet the neighbors as well and talk to people when they're like, hey, what are you doing in my yard? And we're like, hey, just cleaning up trash. And they're like, oh, okay. And then like, why are you doing that? And we're like, oh, we're th from the church up the road. Wear your landmark shirt, come out and clean trash. It's, it's super fun and super easy. Uh, it, it is a great time. So that is coming up on Saturday. We're going to say 10 a.m., Saturday at 10. That way we can try to be done for lunch. Right, that's a good game. That's a good goal. So uh, that's coming up, and then a few other things. Uh, our daughters of the king have a couple different things going on. The first uh, is that they, through the whole month of April, so we have just a little bit, uh, a little bit left, another week or so. Uh, they are collecting blankets, uh, new throw blankets for moms in the Maples Nursing Home, and you've probably seen that table. It's looking full, but there's always room for more blankets. And if they're in a, con if they're like wrapped up in a bag, you can put them 
under the table. Some of you have already done that. So we will collect as many as we can. Uh, we're excited that, that they're doing that. But also, on uh, May 5th, Friday night at 6 p.m. is their first Fridays. Uh, and they're going to do, a, uh, they're, we're hosting a community baby shower for Mary's Cradle. That's May 5th at 6 p.m. And that's not just a landmark. We have put that word out to a whole bunch of people in the area. Mary's Cradle does some wonderful work, some great things. And if you like helping people, if you like helping moms and you like helping babies, uh, next week we'll start talking a little bit more about the Able Pregnancy Resource Center. They're getting ready to start their baby bottle drive as well. So lots of opportunities to help babies in our community and beyond. And I know this church has a strong history of supporting those things. So keep up the good work. Um, I think that's it for now. There's some other things coming up in the future, uh, but you guys can watch the announcements and, and things and read a bunch of that stuff, and we'll talk about those things as they get closer. If you are willing and able, would you stand with us and pray as we move to musical worship today? God, we thank you so much for opportunities to serve this community, and we thank you for other services that, that come alongside of us and, and make that possible. God, we think of the Able Center. We think of Mary's Cradle. God, we couldn't, by ourselves, we're, we're not a big church, and there's only so much we can do to help this community, but we can partner with these other groups and organizations to make a difference in your name, and we thank you for opportunities to do that. We thank you even for this place and for this day. God, we ask that you would be in this place, that your presence would come and be with us, that we would know that you are here. May every word that we sing, may every word that we hear from the sermons, may everything that, that we say be honoring and glorifying to you. Speak to us today. Take our burdens from us. May we place them in your hands. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Let's worship the Lord together.
I love the words to that last song. Um, when we see you, we find strength to face the day. Um, I've heard it said that worship is just like a prayer that we sing. And there's so many wonderful lines in these next couple of songs. Um, this one is a personal favorite, Because He Lives. Um, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, every fear is gone. Sometimes in worship, there's you might be dealing with something, and it's like, oh, yeah, that's a really nice idea, but I'm not feeling it, and um, I'm not identifying with that. You know, I don't have, like, all the joy and the peace and everything, but you can make that your prayer. God, I don't feel like I have hope this morning. Can you show me hope? Lord, I, I don't feel like I am forgiven this morning. God, forgive me. And God pours that out on you. So I pray that you just don't sing these words, but you take them into your heart and into your soul and offer them back up to the Lord as a prayer because he lives.
this month is actually four years I've been coming here. Almost exactly four years I've been this week. And um, I'm here because I didn't want to be. <laughs> I had a gun and I didn't want to be here anymore. This is my family. This is my best friend, Christina. And I made it through that night. And then she brought me to church here. And she still continued to pray with me every day until I wanted to live again. And, and it's all because he lived that I wanted to live again. I had been in church off and on all my life, but I had never felt the love of Christ like I felt when I walked in these doors. I hope you feel that every time you walk in these doors, too. Folks, I know that we often have prayer time at the end, but the altars are open. If you want to just talk to Jesus about something, you can pray by yourself, or if you want someone to pray with you, come on over here, and someone will pray with you. Um, we just want to respond to what God is doing. This isn't just singing only time. This is our time of worship. This is our time of reaching out to the Lord, maybe making things right if we need to. And let's just express this song together. Jesus, we love you. <laughs> Thank you. 
You're the very breath in, in, our, in our bodies. Lord Jesus, I pray that each one would sense your presence today and they would go out knowing that God loves them, God is interested, and there is hope to be found in Jesus Christ today. And God, I pray that we would be able to take these things that we've learned, this new life, this new hope that we have in Jesus, and we would take it out into the world. And we'd be able to share it with people in a real way in a way that would make sense to people. And God, I just ask that you continue to move in this service. We thank you for everything that you're doing, for the lives that you're changing, for all the things that you're going to do. God, we thank you. We love you. Bless the rest of this service. In Jesus' holy name. down. Um, we're going to go ahead and dismiss our children to Children's Church. So kids, you, the, okay, the kids are in the gym today, so it, it looks like there's something really special going on. So um, I don't know. I don't know. Go ahead and greet everyone, um, and let's have a great rest of service.
chains of the past are broken at last, I got saved. Oh, I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I've got Jesus. How could I want more? I receive nothing but goodness. I've tested and tasted your grace. I was so lost till I fell at the cross and got saved. Yeah, I got saved. A lot of us in this room remember what that felt like the first time that we realized that that was true, the first time that God got a hold of our lives, saved us and changed us. At least I remember that. I'm sure most of you do too. This morning, we're going to finish our look at uh, what's probably one of my favorite books of the entire Old Testament, and that's the book of Jonah. And last week, we went through the first two chapters, so if you weren't here, uh, you can find that on our YouTube page or on Facebook, and you can uh, look that up. Uh, you can watch that video, just don't do it right now, uh, please. Uh, but last week's, the, the whole point, the whole purpose, uh, the, the, from Jonah chapter 1 and chapter 2, uh, the whole thing that stood out to me that I wanted you guys to take home was the fact that we cannot escape from God. Now, whether that fact brings comfort or fear <laughs> really depends on you, but I take comfort in that. This morning, the bottom line from Jonah's chapter 3 and 4 is that we're called to care. And so hopefully we'll sit on that and, and that'll become evident. But let's pray together. God, we thank you for what you've done so far today. God, we are called to care because of how much you care for us. You got a hold of our lives. You saved us. You changed us. God, you've done and, and moved in our lives, and that's been evident even this morning by our responses through, through the music today, God, that you, you care about us, and that has changed our lives. And so we ask that today as we look at the story of Jonah, that, that we could find ourselves and we could find what you're trying to teach us in that story, and that, that we could not just take what you've done for us and keep it to ourselves, but that you would give us courage and opportunities to care for others the way you care for us. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, amen. 
So uh, as I mentioned last week, this series is a little bit different because there's so much background information on the book of Jonah. There's, uh, there's a lot of things that, we, that it's, it's helpful to know. And that's one of the cool things uh, about Scripture. Um, and maybe you knew that, maybe you didn't. But uh, no matter how deep or how shallow you want to get with it, God always has a message for you. If you just want to randomly pray and open up the Bible and put your finger down, God can speak to you. But if you want to take the time and study, and, and, and do all the research between like who wrote what and when was it written and what was happening. And if you want to go all the way in there and dive into the deep end, pun intended, uh, God still has a message for you there as well, right? So, so whatever you want to do. So uh, it's, it's so amazing that the, the word of God can do that. No other thing can do that. And I think that's awesome. So um, I'd like to do just a recap of some of the important background information from last week just to bring everybody up to speed. Uh, remember that Jonah, the, the, the book of Jonah, can be read as historical truth. That is possible. That's one way to look at it. You open it up and you're like, yeah, this happened just the way that it happened. Uh, and you can certainly read it that way, that everything written happened as we read it. But most Bible scholars typically view it or understand it, that it was written as a parable with Jonah representing the people of Israel. And, and uh, there's a lot of reasons why that view is prevalent. And here's just a, a few of the most commonly cited reasons why Bible scholars think that. Number one, it's the only prophetic book in which the prophet of the book isn't called a prophet. Nowhere in the book of Jonah does Jonah call himself that or, is he, or does God call him that? They just call him Jonah. They don't say the prophet Jonah, which is weird. Uh, also, it is, uh, has no pieces of prophecy in it for Israel. Most of the books of, that we read are prophets sent to Israel to tell Israel to do or to stop doing something. This one doesn't. Jonah is sent to a foreign country, a different place. And the prophet in this one is not obedient. In every other book, God says the word of the Lord came to whoever the prophet is. And then he went and did what he was supposed to do. In Jonah chapter 1, the, like the first verse in there, he does not do what he is supposed to do. And so that's unusual. And so a lot of people think that that's one of the reasons why this is more of a parable. And then the last reason, and my personal favorite, is the intentional use of humor and exaggeration that we find in Scripture. We're going to find some of it today. Um, and so I'm excited to get to that. Bible scholars believe that it's based on legends surrounding the, the actual prophet Jonah. There was a real person, a real prophet named Jonah, who served King Jeroboam II in, from 788 to 747 B.C., give or take. Uh, and we find the only reference to him in the book of 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 25. It says, he was the one who restored the boundaries of Israel from Lebo Hamath to the Dead Sea in accordance with the word of the Lord, the God of Israel, spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet from gath Hepher. That's the only time we see Jonah mentioned outside of this book. And just one little sentence that he spoke a prophecy and then the king did what he was supposed to do. That's it. And so there are lots of legends that sprung up around him about what he did and didn't do. And so the, we think that the book of Jonah is one of those things that came out from it. Now, that's when Jonah lived, but this book, most Bible scholars have evidence and believe that it was written after Israel returned from their uh, exile in Assyria in the 4th or 5th century B.C. So that's 500 to 400 B.C. So uh, just over 200 years after Jonah actually lived, that's when we think this was written down which ties into why Jonah refused to go to Nineveh. That's one of the reasons why he wouldn't go to Nineveh. It was the capital city of Assyria. And they, they are known for wickedness and violence. And uh, Assyria, if, you're not, uh, if you don't have all your Bible history right there in your brain, Assyria was a foreign country that came and conquered Israel. And they conquered 12, 10 of the 12 tribes, forcefully relocating and enslaving them. And so the hearers and readers of this, uh, of, of the story of Jonah, would have had parents, grandparents, or great-grandparents who experienced that. They were still, this was still pretty fresh. 
and, and so uh, when they hear the story of Jonah, even to this day, when the, the Israelite people, the Hebrew people, uh, hear the story of Jonah, they're a little bit salty about it, <laughs> all right? And so there's our recap, and so now we're going to dig into chapters 3 and 4, and we're just going to read a few verses at a time. We're going to stop and, and discuss them, and most people check out after Jonah gets eaten by the fish and spit on land. A lot of people think the story actually ends there, but there's two more chapters to do. And so I, I'm actually convinced that the real heart and the main message of Jonah is found in the second half of the book. And so we'll start with Jonah chapter 3, uh, verses 1, 2, and 3. It says, Then the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message that I give you. Jonah obeyed the word of the Lord and went to Nineveh. Now Nineveh was a very large city. It took three days to go through it. So this echoes the beginning of Jonah. God calls him again and says, hey, I got a job for you. And this time he goes. And now we'll see the author of this book mentions that Nineveh is huge. He says it takes three days to see the whole place. And based on, on what people have discovered about Nineveh through archaeology and digging it all up, it might be a little bit of an exaggeration. <laughs> you know, it was, you know how it goes. You catch a fish, and it was this big, and then the next time it was this big, and then the next time it was this big. Right? You know how it goes. And so that's kind of what happened, which is, and that's a very common thing when telling parables. And current excavations uh, from uh, two years ago uh, put the actual city about three miles long with a wall that's eight miles around it. So it wouldn't take you three days to see the whole thing uh, unless you go really slow. But even though this is an exaggeration, it serves a purpose because God chooses each and every word of Scripture for a reason. And so why talk about how big the city is? What's the point? Why throw that in there? Well, because it emphasizes the extent of Jonah's success and God's mercy. The bigger the city, the bigger the miracle. So keep that in mind. Moving on to the next couple verses. It says, Jonah began by going a day's journey into the city, proclaiming 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. The Ninevites believed God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them from the greatest to the least put on sackcloth. Now, um, some other translations don't say that he went a day's journey. It says that he just started into the city. Whatever uh, version of the Bible you read, they, they kind of are translated a little bit differently. But th the point is, he didn't go straight to the king. He didn't go to the rulers and the officials. He just kind of walked into the city and just yelled. And whoever was listening heard it. And then that was kind of it. He, uh, he kind of half-heartedly delivered this prophecy. And, and how do we know that? Well, because, you know, it, well, one, there's no exclamation point there. <laughs> uh, but two, um, now I'm not a Hebrew scholar. I'm not going to show you all the words in Hebrew. But Jonah only says five words. Like in the English translation, it's a little bit longer than that. But in the Hebrew language or the Aramaic language, he would have used, this is five words. That's it. He goes to the city. He says five words, and then that's it. We don't hear another thing from him until the end of the book. Like, that's it. Most prophets, like, make a spectacle. If you read about certain prophets, like, uh, from, from all over the place, they, sometimes they, they have big displays, or they, they lay in the middle of the city, and they yell at people as they walk by, and they keep proclaiming, keep proclaiming, or they, they climb up somewhere where somebody can hear them. Jonah doesn't do any of that. He just walks in, does what he's got to do, the bare minimum to get by. That's what he's doing. And this was also recorded this way on purpose. Because the reaction of the Ninevites can only be credited to God and not to Jonah's excellent preaching. Because he doesn't convince them. He doesn't make a good argument. He just says, hey, you're going to be destroyed in 40 days. That's it. That's all he does. And so their reaction is amazing when you think about it. And it can't be credited to Jonah because he doesn't even want to be there anyway. Right? But what do they do? It says they believed God. Now, the Assyrian people are not God's people. 
They don't have a reason to believe God. They don't worship him. They are familiar with him because of the Hebrew neighbors, maybe, but they don't worship God. They don't have any reason to believe them, or for, they don't have reason to believe him, and they do, though. They don't know who Jonah is. They don't have a reason to believe him either, but they do. And they immediately go into mourning. It tells us they put on sackcloth. And that was a thing that people would do back then. If you are in mourning, if, if something bad has happened, or in this case, something bad is going to happen, you're going to prepare and you're going to sit in the most uncomfortable clothes you can get. And you're going to make yourself miserable on purpose to try to appeal to whatever God you're worshiping to try to change their mind. And that's what they do. They put on the sackcloth, and they and they probably fasted too, because they believe they're about to be wiped off the planet. And so they're like, "Oh no, what are we going to do?" And so that's what they do. And the next couple of verses give us a, a deeper look as to to what that what that looks like. It says, "When Jonah's warning reached the king of Nineveh, and again, not from Jonah, because he didn't go there." But he rose from his throne, he took off his royal robes, he covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in the dust. This is the proclamation he issued in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let people or animals, herds or flocks, taste anything. Do not let them eat or drink, but let people and animals be covered with sackcloth. Let everyone call urgently on God. Let them give up their evil ways and their violence. Who knows? God may yet relent and with his compassion turn from his fierce anger so that we will not perish. Just like the sailors in chapter 1, the way the Ninevites react would blow the Israelites' minds as they hear this story being told or as they read it. They did not think the Ninevites were good people. They are hoping that they're going to be wiped off the face of the earth in this story, right? And maybe when they, they read it, they gave the sailors the benefit of the doubt since they were in the middle of a storm and they were freaking out and, and trying not to drown. But these Ninevites, they even admit that they're violent, awful people. And as far as the Israelites are concerned, they couldn't possibly change. But they do. In this story, they do. All of them change. From the king on down, they change. The king, uh, and again, that's another exaggeration by the author. There's, there's no records of Nineveh having its own king, uh, the Assyrian king, maybe. But even this king humbles himself and holds out hope that if they repent that God might have mercy on them. I mean, his words say, who knows? God may yet relent. It's also funny that, to me anyway, that they even command the animals to fast and wear sackcloth. It's not just the people, it's the animals. Like, hey, don't feed your cows, don't feed your dogs or wolf things or whatever they had, right? Put them in sackcloth too. Do you know how hard it would be to put a goat in sackcloth? I don't know. I've never tried, right? But, like, that's what they did. They're, they're like, um, you know, trying to put a potato sack, like, on a cow. I don't know how they did that, but they did. It says they did. They, everybody fasted, and everyone put on the cloth, and they did it. And in verse 10, we find out what happens with that. It says, when God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction that he had threatened. It really paid off putting that goat in the potato sack, right? It worked for them. Now we move to chapter 4. And one of my favorite passages of Scripture ever. It says, but to Jonah, this seemed very wrong. And he became angry. He prayed to the Lord. Isn't this what I said, Lord, when I was still at home? And actually, he didn't actually say this. If you read chapter 1, he didn't actually say this, right? But he says, this is what I tried to forestall or to prevent by fleeing to Tarshish. Try to say that word five times fast. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents 
from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. It's a little bit dramatic, right? A little bit more. Anybody have teenagers? Right? I don't have them yet. I've worked with a lot of teenagers, and this is like you're grounded for a week. Oh, I'm going to die, right? This is exactly what he's doing. This is why I think that this is another reason why a lot of scholars feel like this is a parable, because a prophet would not talk to God like that, right? But Jonah has the exact opposite reaction of any other prophet. Normally, I mean, the whole point of God's messages of impending doom are to get people to repent and stop doing what they're doing, right? God does not want to destroy them. That's why he sends prophets to give them warnings. And if a prophet delivered his message and then the, everybody turned and repented, they should be like, yes. But Jonah's like, no, right? And again, like all of these prophets, they always deliver messages to Israel, to God's people. They're like, hey, stop worshiping other gods. God's gonna do, God doesn't like that. Hey, stop doing whatever it is you're doing. Hey, stop marrying people from the other countries because God told you not to do that. And, you, and you know, if you don't stop, God's going to get mad. And they never listen. You know what the Israelites actually normally do to their prophets? They kill them. Uh, Jesus actually references this in Matthew chapter 23. He says, Jerusalem, Jesus is outside the city. He's looking over Jerusalem. He's, he's kind of praying over the city. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, and you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Jesus knew, right? Prophets in Israel do not have a good track record. They deliver bad news. People get mad and murder them. But that doesn't happen to Jonah. The opposite happens. We see a successful prophet, a, a success. He, you know, we see that these unholy Awful Ninevite people repent, and God decides not to destroy them. And that is awesome news for them. But that apparently is the worst possible news ever for Jonah. He's so upset that God had mercy on them that he reverses his prayer of thanksgiving from chapter 2 and now prays that God would take his life, right? Like in chapter 2, he's inside the fish, and he's like, God, you heard my cry, and you saved me. Thank you. I'll do whatever you want me to. And now he's like, God, I just want to die. I can't believe you forgave those jerks. And that's it, right? He's a little dramatic. And, and notice that he also has the audacity here to give God, and I told you so. Did you catch that? He's like, this is why I left. I knew you would do this. I told you you would forgive them. Right? A real prophet would never dare to back talk God so directly. But maybe we have these thoughts from time to time. Jonah is very relatable to me. Sometimes we see people in the world around us, and maybe we know some things about them. Maybe... Maybe we look at them the way that the Israelites would have looked at Nineveh as like these awful people, like they're sinners. They don't have God. They don't do anything that they're supposed to. They cuss and they swear and they drink. Maybe they even dance. I don't know if you guys, uh, that's an old Baptist humor from where I grew up. Um, some of you get it, right? But, but like we have these opinions of other people and we see them being prosperous in life. Things are going well for them. And we're like, God, do you know what they did? How could you bless them instead of me? God, how could, do you know how awful they are? Why is their business successful? God, do you know how bad they are? How come they got that promotion? God, why are you forgiving them? Why, why are you blessing them? Why are good things happening to them? And maybe we've never, you know, did what Jonah did, but we've had some of those thoughts. And Jonah's also upset, not just because God forgave them, but he's also upset that his words didn't come true. 
So now he's a false prophet because he went in and he didn't tell them if they repented, God would save them. He didn't give them that option. He just said, look, God's going to destroy you. And they didn't get destroyed. And so now he looks like a liar. He looks like a fool. And he's not happy about that. He's more concerned with his reputation in a foreign country that he doesn't even like than he is with the lives of all of these people. He's mad that God saved all of these people. And that he looks like a fool. Like his priorities are a little bit off, aren't they? Maybe sometimes ours are too. Finishing up here uh, in verse chapter 4, starting in verse 4. The Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry? Jonah does not answer that question. <laughs> Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. And I, I picture him like my children, right? Like when one of them wants to do something and I tell them no. And then they go and they sit and they pout in the corner. Have you guys ever experienced that? Right? I feel like that's kind of what Jonah does. Like he goes and he sits down and he's like, hmm. Right? And he's, he's sitting down a place east of the city. And there he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Um, God already said he was going to forgive them. Like he didn't destroy them. The 40 days are up. But Jonah's just sitting there pouting anyway, probably like waiting for some tornado to show up or something. Um, we're not exactly sure. But then the Lord God provided a leafy plant and made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm, which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, I'm glad you guys are laughing. This is funny. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. I don't know if he's bald or not. We don't have a description. I picture him as being bald, uh, just for added story, I guess. But it blazed on his head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die again and said, it would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said. Right? Like when I do this, when I discipline my children, right? And it's like they get mad over something like, is it right that you hit your brother? And you're in timeout for it? Yeah. Right? You guys know. You guys know. Right? But Jonah replies, it is. And I'm so angry, I wish I were dead. You ever been that angry before? Maybe when you were like eight. Right? But God speaks to Jonah. The, fir the very first couple of verses, God speaks to Jonah. But Jonah doesn't answer. He just storms off. Now, and, and again, I, I do believe this is a parable, but how gracious is God for not wiping him off the face of the planet, right? If I back talk my dad and then ignored a question that he asked me, I would not be here today, right? But God uses this as a teachable moment because he's the perfect father. And he makes this vine so Jonah's head doesn't get too hot. And then he gets rid of it to kind of try to illustrate a purpose. And Jonah gets so mad that he again wishes for death. And this is interesting. God, it says that God uses the east wind, which is the same wind that he used on the sailors to create a storm. God loves the east wind. It's his favorite, I guess. And so he uses this east wind. And God asked Jonah the same question he asked at the beginning. Do you have a right to be mad about this? In verse 4, it was like, do you have a right to be angry that I did not kill all of these people? But then God brought it down and says, do you have a right to be upset about this plant that died? In the last two verses, this is the, the in my opinion, this is the, the reveal, the whole point and purpose for why Jonah is, this, is even in our Bible. It says, the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not be concerned, or should I not have concern, for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? 
And that's how this, this is how the story ends. Jonah does not answer that question. We are meant, the listeners are meant to ponder that question, are meant to answer that for themselves. Should God care about all the other people? Should I not be concerned about that great city? God revealed Jonah's selfishness and his pride. He says, look, you got mad over this plant, but like you didn't have anything to do with this plant. Should I not care about all of these people? And it says who don't know their right hand from their left. That, that mean, basically means they don't know right and wrong. Like they don't have a clue. They just do whatever it is that they want. Sounds kind of familiar, maybe. But maybe that sounds a little bit like the world we live in today, right? And God reveals Jonah's selfishness and pride, which in turn is supposed to cause those that read this book or hear this book to examine themselves for their own selfishness and pride. And here in 2023, that is for us. We are Jonah in this story. Notice he's not the hero of this story either. God asks whether he should care about those lost people. And most of us, the assumed answer is yes, God should care about them. He obviously does because he sent a message to them and chose not to destroy them, right? Because they repented. By extension, Israel, and now us as Christian people, we have to ask ourselves this question. If God cares, should we care? Should we care for those who don't know right from wrong? Should we care for those who are lost? Should we care? Because God does. Should we be concerned with those sinners who don't follow God's rules? Should we, be, should we care about those people who don't do things the way that we do? Or who people who watch things that we don't watch? Or say things or speak words that we don't say? Or go to places that, that we don't go to? Should we care? about those people who are obviously lost? Should we be concerned with those people who've done us wrong? Because remember, as they hear this story, this is another country that just captured and enslaved their grandparents. Should they be concerned with that country and those people? Should we care about those who've done us wrong? Should we care about those people who are just so different from us, who vote differently, who put the signs of their candidate in their yard right next to my house knowing that I don't like that candidate? Should we care for them? Should we care about the homeless or the drug addicts or the drug dealers? Should we care for the, the angry atheists who, who tell us that we're stupid for going to church? Should we care about them? Should we care about the LGBTQ plus whatever other letters they're going to put on there? Should we care about them and their lifestyle? Should we care? The answer is yes, because God cares for them. And the church does not have a good track record of caring for those people. The church's track record is standing out there with a sign that says your sinners are going to hell. That's our track record. And you don't have to take, you don't have to look very far to find all kinds of examples of that. That is the exact opposite of what God was trying to teach the Israelite people and even to us. See, we are called to care. And by the way, caring does not mean condoning or agreeing. Right, there was a, a famous phrase when I was growing up in church. It says, we, we love the sinner but hate the sin. Right? Maybe some of you are familiar with that. Look, we need to care about those people because God cares for them. Do we agree with what they're doing? No, and we don't have to. But we are called to care. Because if God cares, we have no other option as true followers of God to care about what he cares about. And he's made it abundantly clear that he cares about sinners and the lost. Now, the Israelite people, they made a mistake. And I think in a lot, of, uh, a lot of Christian people and maybe the church, capital C, in America has maybe made the same mistake. See, they viewed being chosen and saved by God 
as a life full of benefits and privileges. Like we're God's favorite and you're not, poo-poo on you. You know, they, even in Jesus' day, they treated Samaritans. They, they, they were half-bloods, and they would travel days around to avoid them instead of telling them about God. Right? They made the mistake of thinking that being saved by God sets you up for privilege and benefits. Kind of like uh, being a member of a country club, right? If they, if they paid their dues which were doing their sacrifices and trying not to break any commandments, if they paid their dues, then they got the benefits of being God's special people. But they missed out on the fact that being God's people is less of a privilege and more of a responsibility. It's our responsibility to represent him and his wishes on this earth. And and the church has a chance to do what Israel didn't do. We have a chance to get it right. We have a chance to care about what he cares about and to take that responsibility to heart. And so as we get ready to close, we need to to think and reflect. God's given us opportunities. May we get it right. And we're not perfect. We're not always going to love the unlovable. They're called unlovable for a reason. But God has loved us so much. We've sung about that. We've, we've heard that. We know that, look, if, if God only cared about people who got it right, none of us would be in this room. And sometimes we forget and we extend, we don't remember to extend that to others. Sometimes we forget that one time we were just like that one person we can't stand to talk to. And yet God saved us. And it's through another person, most likely. It's our opportunity to be that. Don't be Jonah. May we get it right. May we remember that we're called to care. We're going to pray together. If you are willing and able, would you stand? We already had a moment earlier where God was moving and you could do your business with God however you needed to, but at this time, as, as is typical for us as we close our service, if you have something you'd like us all to pray about today, we would love for you to do that. Come down, talk to me, and we'll share your request. If God is stirring something in you, and, and, and maybe you feel the need that you need to submit yourself, but you don't necessarily want or, or, or need to tell people what's going on, you can come up to the front and pray at this altar. Nobody will bother you. Nobody will ask you. If you want us to pray with you for something, come and talk to me. Listen to the words of this song. Join in. May it encourage us and challenge us. have a quick thing uh, the Greg wanted to come up and represent the elder board and has something to, to
to present to us today. And then after that, you guys are free to go. You got your microphone working? Jeff, we learned last week that the 25th is a special day for you. Yep. You're going to be another day older and wiser. Hopefully. Hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> so on behalf of the Elder Board and the church, we want to thank you for your token of appreciation. Appreciate it. You're welcome. Thanks. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Pastor Jeff. Happy birthday to, to me. You. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you guys for that. I'm excited. It is coming. We were supposed to do some fun stuff as a family yesterday, uh, but uh, Grayson has been very, very sick. I'll spare you the details, but actually I won't. Uh, it's coming out both sides and has been since Thursday. So. Uh, so pray for us. The rest of us are still healthy, um, but hopefully the little guy feels a little bit better. Um, but so as you guys pray, pray for us that we help uh, help him stay hydrated and healthy. Uh, but thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. I can't wait to see you guys on Wednesday night for fellowship dinner. There's going to be cake. Yeah. So have a wonderful week.